Hi, Musa Hamad, Director of Operations and Procurement at J2 Global Inc. Musa, well, so thanks so much for making time joining us on the Abbey Podcast. Uh, before we jump and talk about your current organization, your roles and responsibilities, all that great stuff, give us a thumbnail version of your career to date. Yeah, absolutely, John. Thank you so much for having me. Very excited to be here. Um, you know, I've been in information technology since about 2007, and I would say uh, kind of fell backwards into it um, in terms of having a mentor, somebody who recognized the talent in me around technology that I didn't even myself see, and he kind of helped guide me towards it. And early on in my career, I always joke when I tell people I was the guy answering the phone service desk, this is Musa, how may I help you? Uh, I'd be there for turners and stuff. Yeah, and it was it was a blast, man. I really enjoyed that one-on-one -on -one interaction with people. And as I progressed through technology, um, you know, I kind of worked my way into more like leadership type roles. Uh, and that was all at a law firm, Perkins Coie, which is a fairly significant size firm up in the Seattle area. When I left there, I was doing trial support where I was literally actually in courtroom with the attorneys helping present exhibits and splice up um, depositions and things like that. Did some really cool patent cases down uh, in the Eastern District of Texas. Uh, got to do a case for IMDB where they were being sued for posting an actress's uh, legal age or actual age. Um, and then transitioned over to more of like direct support services with Paul Allen, where I provided IT support as a part of a team of four for him. Uh, and kind of used that to springboard into management and leadership. So went over to Blueprint Consulting Services up in Bellevue helped them actually start their IT department previously. They were just outsourcing to an MSP. Uh, was lucky enough to land a role at Pushpay as a director of uh, IT ops and procurement. And then ultimately, I'm uh, sorry, IT ops and site operations. And that ultimately led to this role as director of ops and procurement at J2. The, the jump from information technology to procurement was an interesting one. And it basically was brought about by us taking a system at Pushpay, which was inherently broken around how we reviewed and approved contracts and vendors and uh, putting some uh, formalization around it and creating a process that was repeatable and transparent. Um, and this, this caught on. We were able to reduce our SaaS spend significantly. We had much better controls. We were able to be on the offensive as it came to renewals where you know, we were able to position ourselves with the option to look at other vendors which helped us negotiate. And that ultimately led to, um, to being discovered by J2 as I had a buddy that was working there that recognized that they needed help as well. Musa, thanks so much for that background and the overview of your uh, very diverse uh, career timeline to date. Uh, tell us a little bit more about your current area of responsibility, what falls under your purview and maybe a little bit about the company. I understand it's a, it's pretty, it's a pretty big size organization. Yeah, thank you. Um, so, you know, J2 Global Inc. is nearly a 5,000 uh, person publicly traded company. Our, our name certainly belies our footprint. We are all over the world. We support teams everywhere. Uh, personally, for me, I am a part of the operations and procurement team, uh, which sits at the corporate level. Uh, J2 Global's really our, our, our main MO is to go out and to acquire uh, we go out and look for really, um, really strong acquisition targets that, that might need a little help optimizing their business and help them realize that optimization, which in turn helps us be a successful uh, company in terms of our revenue and our EBITDA uh, targets. My team specifically, there's two facets to it. The operations team actually oversees the, um, the maintenance of the colos that we have. When you think about J2 Global, we're kind of broken up into a media and a cloud division. So within cloud, we have things like eFax, we have a backup business, we have a VPN business. And so they, these businesses themselves have a, have a fairly heavy colo footprint as they've been around for a while. We're obviously working to transition much of that into the cloud. On the procurement side, you know, we basically overlay over the top of the entire business. And what's unique for us in procurement is we're one of the first orgs at J2 that's actually spanning business units. The, the main method for operation has typically been that every business unit was responsible for itself and that included procurement. So one of the challenges that we had coming in was getting these businesses that had been so accustomed to doing things on their own to recognize and be willing to work with us at the corporate level so that we could help negotiate deals and create opportunities to realize greater economies of scale. Uh, this mindset kind of came about when our new CEO, Vivek Shah, he took over January 1st of 2018 
And he kind of saw an opportunity where previously each business ran its own, in its own silo to allow them to continue to do that, but also recognize that we're a fairly large company that, that should command a little bit more respect in the negotiation table when it came to purchasing software and hardware. And oh, so that's, that's exciting. Yeah, 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 it's a lot of fun. Yeah, sounds like a lot of fun. And for those that are not so closely familiar with just the overall, um, you know, the purpose of procurement, especially within the IT and the technology organization, tell us a little bit about that. What's what, what's what's area that you guys are really responsible for in terms of driving? Yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, we kind of break procurement into a couple of buckets. Uh, the, main, the main two buckets are what I call transactional and then strategic. The transactional stuff is handled by our team just as much as the strategic. We have a couple of tier one analysts who take in the request, and that's going to be anything from keyboards on up to bulk laptop order to, you know, a drive array for a colo. I mean, you name it, we order uh, networking hardware, we order, you know, the software to support those hardware devices, all of that happens. And it's what I view as the transactional, that's kind of like table stakes day to day. And then for us, where, where I have the most fun probably is those strategic contracts, you know, those large long tail vendors that just span the entirety of the business, those core vendors. So, you know, we talk about things like G Suite, uh, we talk about things like identity access management, we talk about those types of vendors where it, every single employee in the company is going to interact with that vendor, where we see that amount of volume and license purchasing, we definitely want to ensure that we're getting those economies of scale. So when you think about procurement, that's, that's kind of the two main buckets that we attack. We do take a bit of a unique perspective, and that probably comes from my background in the help desk kind of coming up many years ago, where I always tell folks for us, we also, we have an opportunity where we know so many people in the business because we deal with finance, we deal with legal, we're helping the front lines of the business. So we kind of also try to act as air traffic control where if a request comes to us, you know, people always say, oh, procurement will know. And, and, and we, we love and relish that role, right? We try to also help people in that way to bring a little more cohesion to the company as we kind of go on this journey of maturing and working cl more closely together at the Inc. level. Uh -huh. Right, right, right. No, that's very interesting. And thanks for clarifying that a little bit further. Uh, so with, with everything going on in the market these days and us coming out of the pandemic, I'm pretty sure that you're on top of a lot of different trends and ideas that really excite you these days. Share with us those. What are you researching? What are you looking forward to in your mind? What is the next big thing? Yeah, I'll, I'll tell you, I'm, I'm huge on this, man. I love it. And, and we didn't even really get a chance to talk about it when I was kind of going through my background at PushPay. But one of the things that helped enable us to put in a great process there is a tool called Xylo. And I bring up Xylo because what's happening in the marketplace today is there is now, you know, back in 2017, 2018, when I was looking at them, that space was in their infancy. Uh, SaaS cost management is probably one of the most newly oversaturated uh, fields in all of technology. I mean, you have companies springing up out of nowhere. Uh, you know, you've got the blissfullies, the productives, the Xylos, like I mentioned, and, and countless others. If you're a director of IT or you're in procurement, there's zero chance that you haven't gotten at least one email from one of these types of vendors. So it's definitely a space that I keep an eye on because in a lot of ways, it was actually Xylo that helped kind of show me this problem that, that businesses had that I didn't even realize and that the problem could be solved in an automated way. Um, so that's definitely a space I keep an eye on and I do quite a bit with. The other area that I'm seeing a lot of emergence of activity around innovation um, is just simply like just distilling this down to its, its core element is obtaining approvals. Uh, so many companies, and it doesn't matter, you know, I push pay as a 400 person company. I've got J2 as over a 4,000 person company. The issues were always the same. It was always where's the review, who's, who's got to do something with it, who needs to approve it. And so you're seeing a lot of companies coming out that are kind of uh, addressing the problem that we work to address at PushPay by cobbling a couple of tools together. You know, we had Confluence feeding into Asana with a Google form and to allow that visibility to happen. And, and there's been a lot of players that have come into the space that have recognized that there's an opportunity to create a tool set that solves that problem. I think you're going to find there's a bit of a conflict happening in this world right now because 
a lot of what the xylos of the world are doing kind of lends itself to allowing for approval flows, right? Because people will go into like a SaaS cost management type tool and they'll, they'll request it and then that'll kick that off. There's also the idea that some of these approval flow vendors are starting to feed a little bit more into ERP type activities when it comes to like PO cutting and things like that. So I think over the next couple of years, you're gonna see the, 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 big, the big guys are gonna get challenged, right? I think you're gonna see a lot of innovation in the space. A lot of upstarts are gonna come and kind of disrupt things. You'll see a lot of things change from the idea, you hear this all the time now in the space, the idea of codeless you know, configuration and codeless administration, uh, where now, I mean, good, good grief, how many admins do you need to, to do Oracle, right? And so, so I think you're seeing a lot of disruption in space, and I think it's very early in its infancy, and I'm excited to see where it's going to go. Well, those are super exciting trends, and I can definitely relate to a lot of those on so many levels with, you know, fully remote workforce and things that, were, that are being built these days as companies are emerging and building hybrid environments. I think that's very interesting. Um, when, it comes to, when it comes to the whole concept of future of work, uh, and as we talk about you know, the gig workers and we talk about freelancers, we talk about contingent workforce in general, uh, a lot of companies want that flexibility to be able to scale up or scale down, unfortunately, sometimes. Uh, just what, what are your thoughts on that? Just share with us your perspectives on the future of work. Where do you see this going? Yeah, um, you know, definitely an area where I'm probably um, I'm probably waiting to see what's going to happen, just like everybody else. Uh, I think, you know, for us, what I've seen and, and not only speaking for myself, but a lot of colleagues I've spoken to at other companies, you know, when you're talking about those FTEs that are kind of core and essential to a company's operation, I think what you'll see is just a lot of flexibility to be remote. I've certainly taken advantage of it. You know, early on in the pandemic, I relocated to the town I grew up in in Florida. And once I realized that there was going to be no changes to my employment of any kind, we decided to stay. And, and that has changed quality of like, I mean, I, I get up in the morning and go jump on my stand up paddle board and go paddle board around with the gators every morning now, as opposed to being in Seattle when it would be raining most days. So I think obviously you're going to see a lot of that. And that's kind of a no brainer. Uh, going more to like, Kind of that scale up scale down the gig workers and stuff you know in our industry on the media side of the house we already see a lot of freelancers and stringers anyway so it's not necessarily a, a muscle that we're not used to flexing um, but we also have a fairly heavy like call center type workforce element as well and, and interestingly uh, you know we kind of went the other way uh, we took we took a lot of our folks that were offshore who were contractors coming and going and we recognized that we were having a problem with retention with that model. So we actually converted a lot of them to FTE to try to continue to retain them. And so, so in that way, I think you've seen J2 kind of go a different direction than some other folks have had. I can say as director of procurement, I, I get a lot of emails from folks who are looking to help with that workforce flexibility. So clearly the market has recognized that there's a need there. Um, interestingly enough, I also get a lot of emails from companies that help executives relocate. So I think a lot of companies are also seeing that these top tier executives are moving from where they were to these other markets. Um, you know, it's a hard question to answer on the heels of, you know, people kind of sit and say, well, the pandemic's over. I, I think we're still kind of coming out of it. And I think a lot of things are still going to reveal themselves. A lot of companies are probably better positioned than they thought they would be a year ago. I would say that we're definitely one of them. Um, and so I'm excited to see. And I guess for me, as an empathetic human, I just hope that companies recognize the value of making folks full-time employees so that they're more invested, they see less turnover, and people have that sense of like full-time security. Right, absolutely. No, those are very interesting perspectives from, from that standpoint. And I, you know, from the overall contingent worker perspective, you know, I've been there myself as a consultant for many organizations. It's, uh, it's just so much opportunity out there, so many platforms that are really building and catering to that particular need. I think that's a uh, company is going to, we're going to see a lot of that, you know, organizations of various size embracing that, that yeah. trend uh, more and more as we go into the next uh, period. Well, and I and think we, to your, 
to your point, just to add, I think a lot of folks want to go that way to become those contractors, to have that fluidity as well. And if it benefits the employer and they get the quality of life they want, then it's, you know, it's that win-win that we're all looking for. Oh yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. You know, I'm, I'm, I've been myself a per per perfect example of that. Uh, just getting that taste of that freedom and the flexibility. I think yeah. it's very hard to go back from that. Oh yeah. I bet. I bet. I'm, uh, I'm hoping to get there one day. We'll see. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for sure. For sure. Uh, well, so from a standpoint of, so you manage a lot of different vendors, a lot of, you know, companies that collaborate with you guys uh, in a different capacity. I would imagine that, Talent acquisition is another big area uh, that, you know, whether you're actively recruiting or not, it's at the top of your mind 24-7 uh, to be able to surround yourself with, you know, the best people, the best candidates on your teams or within your organization or as you manage vendors that provide that service. Talk to us a little bit about that uh, when it comes to war on talent out there with the candidate-driven market. What are the different strategies that really help you build that very successful and efficient ecosystem of vendors or whatever the case may be, your internal strategies to attract the top talent? Yeah, I think I'll, I'll touch on the vendor thing first, and then I'll jump into the internal FTE type talent. Um, so on the vendor side, one of the things that we look to do very quickly is kind of shift the mindset for somebody being a vendor to a partner. And we talk quite a bit about that. And a really good example of that I would say is the manner in which we interact with a couple of our uh, value added resellers. And so the way we operate and, and, and the mode that we try to get to is that the, the joke, not the joke, but the anecdote I kind of say is if, if we're doing this right, when you look at email threads between the two companies, you, sh you can't tell who's on what side, right? And that's, and that's, that's really what we're striving for because for us working with any of our partners, the idea is that the rising tide is gonna raise all ships. We're helping them generate revenue and, and, and you know, do that by ordering through them. We, we give them the volume, we get discounting. It's a, it's a win, win, win. Like we find balances. I'm at the point now with a couple of my vendors where I can pick up the phone and say, hey man, um, you know, I, I need to shave off a couple points here. Can, can you help me out on your margin and take a little bit of a hit? I've got a, I've got a budget issue. And they'll do it because they recognize on the next go around, they're going to be my first call when I have to go to them. Uh, when it comes to single product type SaaS companies, you know, you have to be realistic, right? If you're going to an Asana and you're ordering 50 seats, you're not going to get the same level of partnership as you do with a vendor like a one login where you go to order 5,000 seats, right? It's just, it's just a different level of care and feeding that that vendor is going to supply to you. So I think part of also maintaining those good vendor relationships is having realistic expectations of what a vendor or a partner can provide to you and communicating those clearly. And I think in our minds, we kind of have a stair-step tier model of, of where a vendor falls within the spectrum of how much we spend with them and how valuable they are to us. And we kind of temper our expectations based on that. And, I, you know, in doing that, I think vendors find that we're fair and reasonable to work with. Um, and we, you know, we continue to expect that from the partners we work with as well. Um, shifting the focus a little bit to internal folks, this is, this is an area that I am so passionate about. I mean, it's, it's, it's one of my favorite things, team building and team development just speaks to my heart. And, and I think, you know, I come back to a quote that, I actually took from Remember the Titans over 20 years ago. And it's like been one of the things that's always stuck in my mind. Attitude reflects leadership. Um, and there's a there's a really great scene in that where those words are spoken. And, and I've kind of always held on to that. And if you look at our team that we have today, the first thing you always hear is it's never my team, it's our team. I'm really big on making sure that everybody has a level of ownership within the team. Uh, the other big thing is, you know, our interview process is very real and candid. We, we, have, we have conversations with folks to let them know what they're walking into. It's not all sunshine and roses here at J2, and they need to understand that we have challenges and we're bringing them in to help address those challenges. So our interview process is pretty rigorous. We cast a wide net. Um, and then, you know, we have a, we have a really strong system of one-on-one, -on -one, of, of consistent and continual feedback. Uh, I do what are called skip levels. So I actually conduct monthly or quarterly meetings and it's at the discretion of the employee with folks who are on the front lines who may be two or three roles removed. 
from me so that I continue to understand what their challenges are on a day-to-day basis. And to your point, I mean, I have an employee right now who is, um, she's being hustled. You know, there's another company that that's trying to take her and it's actually a situation where she's being offered more, but she enjoys the environment here so much that it's a, it's a challenge for her to make a decision. And it's one of those things where you just go and you have candid conversations. Your employees are going to get offers, right? You have to accept that, especially like right now. And, and, I have a conversation with everybody when, when I start working with them. And that conversation is at the end of the day, we're all here for the betterment of the company. But what we're really here for is to ensure that, that our basic needs are met, right? So at the end of the day, I always tell people, I work for Musa Inc. Musa Inc. acts as a really strong agent for J2 Global because I benefit when J2 Global does well. But I always tell my folks the same thing. If you get an offer and it's a strong one and you want to go make a move, you have to do what's best for you. And I find that when you tell people things like that, when you show that you're not afraid to lose them at the expense of them bettering themselves, they tend to actually want to stay because they recognize what you're trying to do for them. Uh, The other thing, and I can ramble about this forever, I'll I'll make one more point and try to bring it home. But, you know, one of the first things that I've done at every place I've gone to is we look at the titles, we look at the roles, we completely rework the org chart, we write very intentional and specific job descriptions. At the bottom of each job description is also like a list for internal folks to understand what they need to do to level up to that role. So there's never a challenge or confusion about what somebody needs to do to progress their career. And I think when you create very tangible targets and things that people need to accomplish in order to continue to move forward, you create an environment where people want to be there and work hard, not only to better themselves, but the company as well. Right, absolutely. No, I, lo- I love those frameworks when it comes to um, not only attracting the talent, but retaining, uh, which, you know, with companies shifting to fully remote, you know, the perception was I'm going to get access to candidates on global scale, yeah. and it's going to be very easy to hire. It's going to be super, you know, just very simple, but overlook the aspect of competition with companies, you know, the competition 10x uh, companies with much yep. better packages targeting the same candidates. Uh, so you, I love the framework, that the overall kind of that leadership perspective in the sense that investing into your uh, teammates, your those that are working with you. What are other strategies that really help you succeed in that space when it comes to like winning that war on retention? Because you've mentioned it's inevitable, but at the same time, creating that environment to be able to help, you know, foster the internal development and, you know, working on challenging projects for your teammates. Yeah. What are the different things that really help you? I think that the really good point to drill in further on that. So one of the fir- one of the things that we've done recently is we actually, one of our business units wanted to go out and buy a, a, a learning platform. Um, and so right there, I have an opportunity. They've come to me for that. So I said, Hey, can I get, uh, a couple of extra seats for my team because there's some folks that I know want to develop themselves that way. So sometimes it's as simple as finding little things that you don't even necessarily have to pay for. You know, and the way we sold that is, hey, you give the procurement team free seats and we'll go sell it to the rest of the business for you, right? So there's ways to get creative. And the team got really excited about that. They loved that they had that opportunity. I think you brought up another really good point too, and one that I can definitely empathize with. When you're kind of sitting in those tier one, tier two type roles, your job gets a little redundant. And so it's incumbent on us as leaders to also from time to time, kind of kind of get down on that level and, and see what folks are going through, what their workload looks like and pull them into larger projects to give them something a little bit different to do, to give them something exciting to work on, but to also give them an opportunity to observe how things take place because that type of stuff will inform how they progress and act as they level up. When, when we, you know, there'll be times where I'm going into a fairly intense high level negotiation or a meeting and I'll go grab one of our folks, one of our tier one or two, two folks and say, come along, I want you to just watch, see what we're doing. Because at the end of the day, there's an element to what we do when we're in meetings that you're just relying on your experience and recall and reading the room, right? And that's not a skill you can learn from an online learning platform. That's not a skill that you can learn from a book. But if you watch somebody put it into practical application and have the opportunity to ask them questions after you're going to learn it a lot better. And then we also take that a step further. We give opportunities for our folks across the board, not just the low-level folks, but on up to the managers that report to me. 
give them an opportunity to kind of level up and do larger deals. So the manager will typically handle deals to a certain threshold. Sometimes if I see an opportunity, I'll go to one of the folks and say, hey, this is a pretty big contract. I'm pretty busy. I, I, I'm confident that you can handle this. Do you mind taking it? And those folks get excited because it gives them exposure to a higher level of negotiation, but it also gives them exposure to higher levels of the business because of the decision makers. And that allows them to be seen and visible, not just to me, but it allows them to put their skill set on display to the rest of the business. And when you're sitting there and you're thinking about leaving a company, those types of things matter. Knowing that your boss was confident enough in you to put you in front of the C-suite, in front of the CEO of a multi-billion dollar company, you're going to remember that. And you're going you're gonna to offset some of that increased salary with the fact that you got that opportunity. And I think I would just close it to say, you made a great point. It's inevitable. So, you know, what do you do in that scenario? You make sure that you treat people well so that when they go to leave, they want to do right by you and they give you the proper amount of notice. Mm -hmm. You have your job descriptions already written and good to go. And, yeah. you know, if, if, if you're able to, and in some areas we are, we have, a, we have a decent footprint in Guadalajara. We talk to our folks like now we know we may be losing somebody. We start talking to recruiters and say, hey, just maybe start filling your pipeline just in case, because we've built such a good relationship with our frontline staff that they're telling us when they're getting offers that they're navigating so that so that we're out ahead of it. And it's not it's not a contentious thing, man. You know, I get really passionate about this because I think we, we, we make talking about job searching and salary so taboo. And we don't have to. It can be a, a, a candid, unemotional, I, I get emotional saying we should do it, but it can be a <laughs> candid and a, an unemotional thing that's just, it's just binary. It's just a fact. Look, this company offered me this. I believe I have a better opportunity there. Good luck. You may come back. Who knows? You know what I mean? And so I think in doing those things, normalizing those conversations, keeping, keeping a dialogue open, exposing them to new and exciting areas of the business and ultimately recognizing that you're going to lose people and being ready for that, I think are some of the ways that we help manage that. Right, right. right. I, no, say, I love those. Know, yeah. And I will say we're over a year without having lost a single person. Now, I think most people were probably a little hesitant to leave during the pandemic. So that probably played to our advantage. But, you know, we'll see. We'll see how it goes and see how long we can continue to avoid that type of attrition. Right. No, I love these examples, especially, you know, something as simple as identifying very little opportunities for your for your teammates to be in front of, you know, decision makers or get, you know, you a bigger exposure. I think that goes such a long way that you basically create these opportunities for for your employees and for your teammates. Uh, that stuff never, is never forgotten. So that's that's very powerful. Yeah, thank you. When it comes to when it comes to effective interviewing, and as you sit down with a you know the prospective teammate or candidate, uh, tell us a little bit more about the strategies you deploy to make sure that initial experience is is of utmost importance. How do you treat the whole interview? You know, just being able to uh, make those assessments in such a short period of time, whether that's one or two hour interview process. Uh, what are the different questions that you ask that really help you make that judgment? Just tell us a little bit more about that. Yeah, absolutely. So the first thing I'll say is for for me personally, my my approach is I typically when we're hiring right now, it's going to be, you know, lower level staff that are handling more tier one, tier two type work. And for me, I don't interact with those people on a day to day basis. And I think hiring is a skill that a lot of people need to learn. And so what I actually do is put the onus on, on, the, on the folks that are going to be interacting with day to day with this person, the supervisors and the managers who are there on the front lines. And I, I ask them, you know, here's, you know, here's the role we're trying to fill. Y'all know what to do. Go to your recruiters, get a pipeline, start interviewing some folks, distill your list down to two or three of your best candidates and then let's do a final round where I'll, I'll come in and have a conversation. And then I want to hear your feedback on where you want to go and, and we'll have a conversation. And, and this method has worked because the folks that are doing the interviewing, they want to make sure they find someone that's going to come in and work hard to help the team move forward, not somebody that they're going to have to drag along. Right. And so, you know, I think we don't even really coach much on what gets asked. I kind of trust the instincts of the folks that I work with to, to know how to pull out the proper information. 
And, you know, when you talk about, we have peers also do interviews. So it's not just the folks that are going to be above the individual, but we have the actual peers of the role that's coming in also conduct interviews and give inputs. If somebody's a peer of someone that they're interviewing and they're, and they're hesitant and they give really good reasons why, that carries weight. That carries absolute weight with us and we likely won't move on with that candidate unless everybody else gives glowing marks and then we try to figure out what's happening here. It may have been a bad day, you know, it could have been any number of things. And that bad day goes on both sides. You have bad interview days and you have bad interviewee days, right? So, um, so that can definitely happen. Um, once we've gotten that list down, that's where I'll take an opportunity to just ask for 30 minutes with the last remaining uh, shortlist of candidates. And, and, you know, for me, it's a conversation. I grew up in a very, and I grew up in a small town in Florida in a very blue collar family. We had gas stations, we had delis, we had contracting businesses. And from the age of seven years old, hopefully the statute of limitations on child labor laws has expired. Uh, you know, I was working cash registers, I was busing tables, I was I was hauling stuff to put on the trucks. Like that was just what we grew up in. So when I talk to folks, I try to pull out and understand if they've had those type of experiences, if they, if, if that's the type of culture that they've come from. And when I say culture, I mean the life culture around them, not the culture of where they live or anything like that, right? Like the mindset, um, you know, so we try to understand that. I'm really big on, you know, I try to ask a little bit about how they deal with difficult customers. That's a, that's a really big thing, because to me, the way we frame things internally is our internal employees our, are our uh, procurement customers, right? And so understanding that there may be times where customers are dissatisfied, how do you manage and navigate that? Um, and then, you know, the big one I ask, and I'm going to throw this out there, hopefully nobody like fact checks me on it, but I read or heard the story many years ago about... Uh, an interview Dr. Dre gave where he talked about, like they asked him, what was your moment? Like, like something you look back on and you're so proud of. And he talked about this like three or four day stretch where he just slept in a studio and recorded this amazing album and he was so proud of it. And so I, I tell that story anecdotally. And then I ask, what was your Dr. Dre moment? When you look back on your career, what is like, what is the thing that you accomplished that you're like, I did that. Um, and if they can't answer that question, I worry. Because if you don't have something that you're so proud of that you've done professionally, I'm not saying that work needs to be your life, right? Like we, but if you've, if you've been in a professional career for many years, there's got to be something you point back to. And if you don't, I, I try to pull more out of you, you know, maybe it's like you're, you're nervous, whatever the case may be. But I think we all have those moments and we can recall them pretty quickly. And so that's one of the things that we certainly look for as well. Um, I would say those things. And then ultimately for me, it comes down to the input of the team. Um, if my spidey sense is tingling and they all want someone and I don't, actually, that's never happened. <laughs> Just go ahead and back it up now. That has actually never happened. And then I'll close it to say the final thing is internal referrals are the best, especially people that are already on the team. They know the day to day and they know the rigors and they know people in the industry. I mean, I have, I have found a lot of great success over the last four or five years by hiring via internal referral. So that's definitely always been a, a good method as well. Obviously those internal referrals still go through the rest of the process and they still get the Dr. Dre question, but there's a little more, uh, you know, there's a, there's a little more of a familiarity and understanding there because of the referral. Yeah, yeah no doubt. No, I, I love the the example of, you know, on the Dr. Dre and I've, yeah. I've heard that story somewhere. You know, okay, good. I, mean, I thought I was making it up sometimes. I worry somebody's going to call me. No, out. no, it's a, I, somewhat of a similar, I guess, concept, but overall just kind of the premise behind that is very powerful. And I love your approach just to interview in general to make that a dialogue, make that a two-way street to really allow the candidate to ask the questions and also give them an opportunity to make that assessment. If you are the right leader that they would want to, you know, collaborate with, if you if you are the right environment, if you are the right culture, I think you've made uh, some very, very uh, powerful points there. Musa, from the last portion of every episode, I'll have to focus on the sources and I guess everything that you consume on daily basis for self-actualization and learning. Yeah. Uh, what do you let your mind be exposed to? Because yeah. there's just so much information out there. Share with us your yeah. sources, uh, your content diet. Sure. So my, it is right now, you know, I, I kind of tell people I ebb and flow and there's times where I'm just like insatiable and I'm in one of those periods right now. So I'm really excited. I get to talk to you about this. 
First, talking about books, actually, there's a book I read every day. Um, it's the Tao Te Ching. I don't, you know, if, if your listeners are familiar with Taoism, um, it's, it's, a, it's a short, very thin book. It's obviously been translated. There's multiple translations. I listen to the Steve, or I read the Stephen Mitchell version. I also listen to it on audiobooks sometimes if I just want something in the background. And there's actually a lot of great anecdotes and tidbits around leadership and being more hands-off and trusting your people. And so, you know, that's that's the spiritual hippie side of Musa and you can take that for what it is. Uh, really big right now, I've, I've actually, in, in the uh, fiction world, I'm, I'm reading this book called Orcs and Crake, which is about a post-apocalyptic world where, or, where organizations and companies are running everything. Uh, shifting though to, to more of like the, uh, professional betterment type stuff. Uh, there's a ton of podcasts I, I consume uh, that are out there. You know, obviously, um, a lot of stuff, uh, audio books. Um, I think one that I listen to or read every so often, I always recommend to people, Simon Sinek, Leaders Eat Last. I'm really big on a YouTube kick right now. So watching a lot of different TED Talks, um, and, and to be honest, you know, I'm struggling a little bit to answer this because candidly, a lot of what I'm focusing on right now is actually around reducing and eliminating the noise that, ha that happens in our modern life around social media and, and, and things like that. So I've recently discovered an author that I was definitely not in the right frame of mind to discover 20 years ago when he was writing things. But David Foster Wallace um, has a couple of really good books out that he's written. He's since passed away. But... So I've kind of gotten in, into reading more about how we can reduce and eliminate the noise in our lives around social and all these other things that are happening and actually even creating boundaries around work. And what that's doing for me is actually making me a better employee and, and I think a better father and a better partner as well. Uh, so roundabout way to answer right now, def I, I read the Tao Te Ching every day. I got a little bit of fiction in my life, um, reading a lot about um, equality and activism. So there's a lot of documentaries I've watched around, um, around you know, the, the world that the culture of slavery within the United States has created today. Obviously some very controversial topics and we don't wanna go too far into them, but you know, I think it's important to keep a wide depth and breadth. So that documentary is called The Cotton Picking Truth if anybody's curious and wants to check it out. Um, but, you know, for me, it's just a lot of right now, self-reflection, spirituality, and, and trying more to have a little bit of fun while also diving more into how to calm the mind and just be a little more intentional in life. So I hope that helps. I know I just threw it Oh, that's of... great. Uh, <laughs> I love those. Those are great recommendations. Much appreciated. And Musa, last but not least, what are you currently reading in terms of the book and, uh, well, which book you always recommend to others and uh, why is that? Yeah, the book that I would say I always recommend to others, aside from the Tao Te Ching, uh, right now, man, I'm, I'm really, I think it's, it's the idea of potentially losing an employee and just, you know, coming out of the pandemic and everything. But I really, you know, I don't know if it's overblown or overdone, but Simon Sinek, anything by him, um, but really, for me, Leaders Eat Last is one that should absolutely be be read. I think he, he finds a way to like get you thinking and leading in a way that's empathetic. And it's what it ties back to one of your questions around retention. I mean, if if you want to build good teams and you want your people to stick around and you want continuity, a book like Leaders Eat Last is it should absolutely be in your library because it's going to help you at least think about how to move towards that. There's no perfect blueprint. Uh, but I would say, you know, if I'm recommending one, it would be that. That book has stayed with me. I read it probably once every year and a half. I listen to it at least on a long car trip or something. And there's always something new I take from it. So if you take nothing else from this podcast, go buy the audio book, Leaders Eat Last. You will absolutely take something from it. Well, those are great, great recommendations for our guests. We'll make uh, those titles available in the show notes. Musa, I can't thank you enough for your time today. Very short and insightful conversation. Uh, just like with every guest that I love uh, doing is do another recording in about a year and see yeah. how much have changed and transpired. <laughs> we will revisit the conversation from a year ago. I think see. you'll be surprised. I think there's some changes coming on the Musa horizon. So I'll be excited to check back in. <laughs> <laughs> awesome, man. I, I'm pretty sure those are going to be an awesome, uh, awesome changes. Keep us posted. For and sure. definitely thanks for your time today. Yeah, thank you.